Welcome to Get Naked with Dr. Kate. I'm your host, Dr. Kate Balistrieri, a Beverly Hills-based psychologist, certified sex therapist, and the founder of Modern Intimacy. Thanks for joining me here where I talk about sex, relationships, mental health, and dive into your questions with practical answers and real solutions. Each week, I share insights aimed at helping you build an authentic and healthy relationship with yourself, with others, and with your sexuality. It's time to get naked, emotionally, mentally, and on your own time, physically. For about 70% of folks, stress is a libido killer. For the other 30%, there's an increase in desire when people get stressed out. But the bulk of folks really seem to struggle in cultivating erotic energy and sexual desire when stress hits the fan. So today I'm really excited to be speaking with Dr. Jasmine Talley. She is a California licensed naturopathic doctor and completed her undergraduate degree in political science and film studies at UCLA and has her doctorate in naturopathic medicine. Dr. Jasmine focused her clinical training on the skin-gut connection, autoimmune conditions, and mold-related illnesses. She has furthered her training in homeopathy, IV nutrient therapy, and craniosacral therapy. And Dr. Jasmine also works with women and men to optimize their hormone health and provides post-surgical naturopathic care. In alignment with her philosophy of treating the root cause, Dr. Jasmine understands the need for a holistic approach when it comes to achieving optimal health. So today we're going to be talking about gut health, hormonal imbalances, and how this can lead to feeling stress, which can affect us in so many areas of life, including our relationship with sex. Dr. Jasmine, thanks so much for being here today and for sharing your wisdom and expertise. Thank you so much for having me. I've been so looking forward to this conversation about the link between gut health, stress, sexual desire. But before we jump in, can you talk a little bit about what naturopathic medicine is, how you got into this field, and maybe how it's different from other kinds of medical specialties? Absolutely. So as a naturopathic doctor, I always tell people that I focus on finding the root cause of the issue. So whatever that may be. Um, I specifically focus on gut health and hormones, and I do a lot of tests to determine what the cause of the issue is. So for example, like if someone comes in with a headache, why do they have a headache? Is it gut related? Is it hormone related? Really trying to dive deep into what's causing that. And so in short, I always say naturopathic medicine, naturopathic doctors looks at gut health. I mean, sorry, at root cause medicine and gut health, honestly, because gut health is the foundation to health. Um, But basically what um, naturopathic medicine is, we go through, um, we have to take the same prerequisites as any other kind of medical program, medical school. And then we do two years of the general sciences, There's no difference in any like sciences. You can't change science. Um, But basically we go through the sciences and then our last few years is more of the modalities of treatment. So on top of learning pharmaceuticals and um, pathology and physiology and all of that, we also learn herbal medicine, homeopathy, nutrient therapy, um, nutrition is a big part of it, physical Mm -hmm. medicine. So there's these other modalities of treatment Um, that we learn as well. We're licensed to treat and diagnose just like any other like medical doctor, osteopathic doctor and all of that. So basically I would say in addition to finding the root cause of the issue or um, in order to find the root cause of the issue, we tend to do a lot of comprehensive testing looking at not just like a hormone here and there, but more in depth, like what do your hormones look like? How do they um, metabolize in your body? How do they work in balance with one another? What does your gut microbiome look like? Is there some kind of bacterial overgrowth, some kind of pathogen, some kind of parasite, a food sensitivity, things like that that really affect our gut health, our gut microbiome and affect every aspect of our life as well. That sounds so comprehensive. I'm immediately curious about why that's not standard practice for every kind of medical specialty. Yeah, so I guess there's a lot of there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, 
I would say a lot of it has to do with just the time commitment. Um, mm -hmm. So when patients come into the office over here, I tend to spend like an hour really understanding what is going on with them. So not only like, okay, you can't, I just use the headache thing because it's easy. Um, like you came in for a headache, like not only like, okay, you have a headache, you get it. Uh, every time you get a headache, like just take this Advil. I try to really like sit with that person, understand the mental, emotional side of it, mm -hmm. as well as the physiological side of it. If it happens like around menstruation, if it happens because they're not having regular bowel movements, but really like diving deep into like the why to connect the dots. So I think a lot of it has to do with the time commitment, you know, like a lot of times in our medical system, unfortunately, it's very like fast paced, right? You go, you see your doctor or you see your specialist and they only have like 15 minutes to spend with you. Um, and it's not their fault. It's just how the medical system in America is nowadays, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of it has to do with that, like insurance and things like that. Um, I think that's the number one reason I would say why it's not standard medical practice. I think honestly, a lot of the labs that I run should be standard medical practice. They should be run every year because they can tell us so much about what's going on with us. I hear that. And, and it sounds like a big difference in how you practice with what some people might be accustomed to when they see a doctor is a lot of education and really understanding the differences in how the different medical systems in the body operate with each other, not just looking at numbers on labs and saying you're within normal limits or you're not. Like really, I'm hearing there's a weaving together of education and treatment that happens for you. Definitely. And because we are holistic beings, it's just I have yet to see a patient just present with just one symptom. It just doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. um, people think like when they're coming in, like I'm coming in for like that one thing, like whether it's like, let's say like libido, constipation, whatever it is, but it's never like I've just not seen it where it's just one thing. So how can we be expected to just look at one thing and not really see the whole picture? Mm -hmm. And be like, and find like that common ground and like what is going on. That's incredible, and I think so, so well understood. Like we are holistic creatures, and we can't. But there might be some things that we can isolate symptoms and look at just certain parts of the body or certain systems in the body. But when we're talking about something like stress, this is more of a global impact kind of situation. So. What are you seeing in terms of some of the biggest stressors in your patients and, and your practice? So, so there's so much stress nowadays, like um, anxiety, stress, like so it's so tied in together. And I see it affect so many different aspects of people's lives. Mm -hmm. So whether it's and not only I wouldn't say only like current stress, like I'm working a like hard job and I feel stressed or I'm in school and I have like exams or something like that. A lot of it has to do with past stressors as well. And I wouldn't say only like emotional stressors, I would say also environmental stressors, like the stressors that we're exposed to on a daily basis, just being outside and being in an environment which is heavily polluted and we are exposed to toxins. These are all stressors in our bodies. And I see it really, it is very much the root cause of so many different things. Um, and the big one, a lot of times, like I will do like a comprehensive um, stool, stool analysis for a lot of patients that present with irritable bowel syndrome. So like constipation, diarrhea, um, issues with like just digesting food or they feel bloated all the time. That's a big, big part of my practice. And I'll do these tests and we look at this specific marker, um, elastase, meaning like um, we see if the pancreas is able to secrete a digestive enzyme on its own. And it's kind of crazy how often that enzyme is so, so low. And I always have that discussion with patients when I see that about 
stress and how that affects it and our autonomic nervous system being split into sympathetic and parasympathetic and how sympathetic the sympathetic mode is needed it's survival mode we need it to get along in this crazy world sometimes you know um, it's fight or flight we need that but oftentimes when we're go 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 all the time and we're in that sympathetic state of mind we're unable to get into that parasympathetic mode of rest and digest mm -hmm. to naturally secrete those enzymes to digest and break down our food and absorb what we eat. And a lot of times when that happens and we're constantly in that stressor, we're just, we can't digest. So we feel constipated, we feel bloated. Um, we get all these GI issues that if you were to go to like a gastro or any other specialist, a lot of times they'll say there's nothing wrong with you because labs don't show it. You know, like you don't have any pathogens, you don't have any parasites. Um, there's really nothing wrong with you from like a medical standpoint, mm -hmm. but these more specialty tests show us, no, there is something going on. The reason that you're feeling bloated all the time and you feel like you can't eat anything is very much related to the fact that you're just in that stress mindset all the time. And it's really hard to kind of calm down from that, especially like if you're work, like you're working and then you have like a 30 minute lunch break and you're just like on, you're like, go, go, go. And then all of a sudden you get your lunch break and you're like, okay, I just need to like stuff my face. You know, right. like there is not, you like, how do you expect to get into that parasympathetic mode. Mm. Um, How long does it take to shift from, you know, a lot of momentum and movement and sympathetic activation to um, more of a parasympathetic rest and digest where your body feels safe enough to go, okay, I don't have to be on alert? That's a great question. And I think it's actually very different for people. So a lot of times it's just like, it depends on the person and how they hold on to that stress, mm. right? So like some people, if you ask them about their stress, they'll say like my whole body feels stress intense. So like to allow that to relax and really like let go and shift takes longer mm. for other people when they get like, they go home at night and they're, they start to cook um, and they're like, chopping onions and stuff like digestion begins with smell like they get into that parasympathetic mode as they're cooking their food and they smell their food and they release these digestive enzymes and they're able to do it that way so everyone is very different just depending on how they hold on to that stressor and how they cope with stress what their like coping mechanisms are for stress and of course you know like everyone is so different when it mm -hmm. comes to that yeah, it's so true. It's so true. You know, I, I hear a lot of people talking about w their bodies when they're in that sympathetic overactivation state is kind of feeling as if their body is perpetually like clenched or bracing or holding something in their body. And I wonder what other uh, descriptors you've heard from people that might give someone an indication that maybe their body is kind of stuck in this sympathetic nervous system state? Yeah, so a lot of different descriptors, I would say. Um, a big one is also fatigue, just low energy levels. Um, what happens is like they're on such a like high, you know, like for yeah. like years of their life, like just go, 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 like not sleeping and just kind of just going with it, doing it all. And then all of a sudden it really like, it affects their cortisol levels their stress hormone and they just kind of flatline. And I've run these tests and I've looked at cortisol throughout the day. And sometimes for these people, I see it just it's literally like a flat line. It's supposed to go up and down. It's supposed to go up in the morning as you wake up and it's supposed to go down at night and you're supposed to produce melatonin. But for a lot of people, it's just like flat line and i always wonder like how do you get out of bed and i kind of ask it as a joke and they're like no you don't understand i don't get out of bed like i have the hardest time getting out of bed like i am so exhausted and i see this i'll say more with women than i do with men um, and i see both men and women in my practice 
a lot of men's health, a lot of women's health, like literally anything that has to do with hormones, gut health, mm -hmm. that is what I see. But I would see the majority of the ones that I see that have that flat line mm -hmm. are people are women. Mm -hmm. um, and it makes sense if you think about it. Uh, it's not very surprising, but like uh, as women, like oftentimes we're like, we're conditioned. We have to just kind of put up with things, right? Like you get your period, you just pop some Advil, my doll, you go on with your day, you take care of yourself and you take care of everyone around you everyone. as well. And you don't complain doing it. Yeah. It's like a big one, right? You yeah. just make it work. Like what, like, that's it. Like, it's just, it's part of our society. This is what we're used to. So I think so much of it, like, you know, like we have full-time jobs, we have families that we take care of. We have like little babies that are like running around. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, like you really see how it affects women's cortisol. Yeah. Um, and their desire as a result. And, and their desire. Mm -hmm. their desire like the libido is huge it's a very it's a very very big issue because if you're if you're just fatigued mm -hmm. and then it's kind of like um a whole domino effect or like which one came first like did you not have time because you were taking care of everyone else before you're, like you didn't have the time to go and drink water so you're not even able to really like nourish your body and you need water in order to to have like regular bowel movements and to not feel bloated and to really like just make sure you're healthy like did that come first like the time or is it like the way that you cope to stress like what is it that causes this? but it's so intertwined everything is just so intertwined but it definitely does affect desire as well and there's like so many reasons when it comes to this specifically of like how stress affects our desire and how it affects our different hormones and um, all of that. Let's talk a little bit about that. So when when cortisol is in the body and and it's flatlined because and if I get this language wrong, correct me, but the adrenal glands are so exhausted at that point that they're running on some kind of deficiency or they're not able to produce more cortisol. Is that what happens? Yeah. So the way I always explain it is like your adrenals, they sit above your kidneys mm -hmm. and they're responsible for creating your sex hormones. So estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, they're responsible for your mineral corticoids. So your blood pressure response, as well as your cortisol. And cortisol is that hormone that's supposed to go up, as we said, mm -hmm. in the morning and down at night. So, and then anytime you have any kind of stress in your life, your adrenals take the hit and all of this, your sex hormones, your cortisol, all of these, fluctuate mm -hmm. and that's that's kind of like when i try to like um simplify it like that's that's always how i explain it i'm like when mm -hmm. you have this stress in your life everything else shifts mm -hmm. and that's when really like the cortisol shifts and whenever your cortisone can't metabolize per properly to cortisol which is like the active form of your stress hormone and you kind of just stay in that cortisone and you don't you don't have that switch to really like produce that stress hormone anymore and then you flatline oh interesting okay and then what yeah. happens to the other hormones when you flatline with the testosterone so the other hormones also shift so yeah. like um a lot of times so like testosterone when people are very stressed and i actually see this not only with um like mental stressors and emotional stressors. I see it actually with athletes too. Uh -huh. So you would think like, oh, athletes, they have high testosterone levels because, you know, they're working out, they're putting on muscle and all of that. But I actually see it a lot of times where I'll run labs and I'll see, wow, this person's testosterone is so low, but they're like, they are always working out and they are so fit. And there are studies that show that kind of stress on your body when you're exercising so much is also a stressor on your body and actually reduces your testosterone level as well. So any kind of stress can shift all of these hormones. And when these hormones shift, it often will 
cause issues with libido, with desire, and all of that. Because like if you're, for example, let's say your estrogen levels go down. When estrogen goes down, we don't get that lubrication. We get that vaginal dryness. Mm -hmm. Um, There's also shifts in like just mood in general. Women tend to feel more depressed and men, I would say. You need that estrogen. And when that testosterone goes down, same thing. You feel like um, you don't have that motivation and that um, desire. And there's a lot of issues that come across with libido and all of that as well. Or your progesterone, whenever your progesterone goes down, progesterone is the hormone that is so necessary for sleep. Hmm. So as women get older and they go through menopause and their progesterone levels drop, all of a sudden they have insomnia. Like they just can't sleep through the night. Like nothing works. Um, And it's kind of crazy how many women around that time period go on either sleep medication Mm -hmm. or some kind of anti-anxiety medication. And it has so much to do with your progesterone levels because progesterone helps with the calming effects. So it helps with anxiety. It's not only like for hot flashes and getting rid of that, but it's really for mood. It's such a big, Hmm. like if you have low progesterone levels, like, yes, you're going to feel like crappy all the time. This is why women in general, when progesterone drops right before their period, they get those PMS symptoms and they get moody and they get irritable. Hmm. So around like perimenopause, menopause, same sort of thing happens. So if someone's not sleeping and they feel anxious and all of that, that's also going to affect their libido. And it really just starts with like those adrenals, with that stress in your life. Yeah, amazing. It's it's all so um, unconscious to us, right? And we only become aware of it when we're in pain. But for a lot of folks, it's like the kind of pain that maybe doesn't register as significant enough to warrant further investigation. You know, I know so many people who will live with symptoms like this for years because they think it's just the byproduct of aging or it's just because they have a stressful job, but there are different things that we can do about it to help our hormones course correct is what I'm hearing. So so what can people do about it in terms of lifestyle and in terms of treatment options? Yeah, so I would say definitely like in the first and foremost, is figure it out. Like, what is causing this? Yeah. Don't accept it as being just because it's your normal doesn't mean it has to be that way. You you know your body well. Like, it's important to advocate for your own health in general and get labs done, like basic lab work. And I always say, first thing you should always start off with is like your thyroid labs. And because your thyroid also, it's another hormone and it's responsible for your entire endocrine system and your, not only your mood and your fatigue and um, how you feel and your weight and all of that, but it's, it's a huge indicator for all of this. And oftentimes when I look at labs from other doctors, only one thyroid marker is checked. Like no one is checking to see if you're actually converting that T4 to the active thyroid hormone, which is T3. Mm -hmm. So I would say the first thing is to advocate for yourself and make sure that you're getting the proper labs done. So you're checking TSH levels, you're checking free T4, free T3, reverse T3. You're checking all these markers to determine what your thyroid looks like. Mm -hmm. I would also say to do a full hormone panel. Like what does your testosterone level look like? your free and total testosterone, your estrogens, your progesterone. And there's different estrogens that you should check for. Hmm. Um, and we'll go, we'll go through that too, because it has a lot to do with libido, but also with testosterone and DHT, dihydrotestosterone. So like, what do all these markers look like? Um, are they high? Or are they low? Really finding out what is the root cause of the issue. Mm-hmm. Um, if your hormones are balanced, does it make sense? Like if your estrogen all of a sudden is really high and your progesterone is really low and then you have some kind of estrogen dominant picture and that would cause irritability and anxiety and insomnia and all of that. So like finding out what your hormones look like. And then based on that, treating it based on that. So like there's 
Like, for example, for me, I do bioidentical hormones in my practice. I prescribe a lot of hormones. It's one of it's one of the fun parts of my practice. But I would say, like, my main modality of treatment is herbal medicine. And there's a lot of herbs that people can take to help support their adrenals. Mm -hmm. So um, there's adrenal support that actually is a combination of different herbs that just help to nourish those adrenals so that when you have that stress, your adrenals are able to adapt to mm-hmm. stress. So they modulate your stress response. There are things that help to also herbs that help to boost testosterone levels. Mm-hmm. Um, there's also herbs that help with your thyroid and also minerals like selenium is a big one. Like they say two Brazil nuts a day helps to support your thyroid health. Interesting. So all of these things help to support our thyroid. Mm -hmm. Um, There's so many different, like zinc is another one. All these minerals help to support our thyroid health. And then there's herbs that work for that as well. Um, But really just like first you find out what's going on and then you treat that way. Or if there is some kind of food sensitivity, like let's say a lot of times biggest food sensitivity tends to be gluten and dairy. No one likes to hear this, but it is it is one of the biggest food sensitivities. So if someone's reacting to those foods, oftentimes they'll also just not feel good overall. Mm -hmm. They'll feel bloated, they'll feel fatigued. And all of that has to do with how they feel, like the energy that they out, like they put out into the world and like their libido and all of that really all comes together. But I would say just try to find out the root cause of the issue first and foremost. And there's so many different root causes, Um, like so, so many. And I would say, Um, like when it comes to like hormones, like if you do have this kind of like hormone deficiency, like why do you have that hormone deficiency to begin with? Right. We're not born this way. Um, It's a lot of times like, is it in the environment? Is it some kind of heavy metal that Mm -hmm. we're exposed to like mercury being a big one because sushi has high mercury levels. Oh, wow. You're eating tuna all the time. And that's one lab that is so easy to test for, like yearly. Like that's, that one always surprises me. I think that should be part of annual labs. Like, you know, you do your CBC, you do your CMP, you do your lipid panel or your thyroid, add mercury. Like, why not? Interesting. I didn't realize that that could have an effect on hormone health. That is so fascinating. Yeah, heavy metals are huge. And the big one is mercury and arsenic. Arsenic is found in rice. Um, And if you're a big rice eater, like I am, it's a good idea to check those levels and see what's going on because these heavy metals are endocrine disruptors. So they throw off your hormones. So if you have these high levels, it will throw off hormones and things tend to shift. Or when it comes to medications Mm -hmm. like the most common ones in my practice i see is women on birth control and men on finasteride for hair growth Mm. Um, so these all mess with hormones and then can create some of these same symptoms you're saying exactly Mm. because what happens is a lot of times with birth control um and it's sucky because as women we don't have many options for birth control, but it is, um, it is what it is with this birth, with birth control. A lot of times we use it it actually to lower testosterone levels. That is what Mm. it's used for many times. That's why when patients have like PCOS, when women have polycystic ovaries, ovaries, and they have, um, high levels of testosterone, their gynecologist gives them birth control on purpose to bring down that testosterone. It, It increases sex hormone binding globulin. It decreases testosterone. And then women say they have lack of desire, low libido, and all of that. But it's a lot of times it has to do with that long-term use of that birth control. Mm -hmm. And then... No, go ahead. And then with men being, I would say, like the number one um, medication that they use because for hair growth is finasteride and finasteride blocks dihydrotestosterone 
and we could get really scientific over here. <laughs> but basically, it blocks this dihydrotestosterone that if you have too high levels of will cause hair loss. Mm -hmm. shifts the pathway backwards to increase a little bit of testosterone, but then that testosterone shifts, it aromatizes into estrogen. And then you create more estrogen instead of testosterone, and then you get like the man boobs and the belly fat. Oh, wow. <laughs> Yeah. And they get a little libido. So it's just like so much of it has to do with like things that people don't think about. They're like, oh, my, I have hair loss. Like, let me, let me take this medication. Like, I don't, like, you don't really like, there's not informed consent out there. Like people don't, there's not enough research. Like people don't have time a lot of times to do the research because we do live stressful lives a lot of times. It always comes down to stress. But there's just like so much going on that shifts all of these hormones. But really understanding like what it is that shifts these hormones is so, so important. Dr. Jasmine, you were mentioning that there are other environmental stressors that can mess with people's hormones and therefore mess with people's desire. What are some of the sneaky culprits around the house that someone might not really think of? So a big one is mold. So, you know, people hear mold, they're like, what, mold? Um, yes, mold. So if there is some kind of water damage in your home and it doesn't get taken care of right away, or a lot of times when you live in an older home or in an apartment, um, it's, it's shocking how, how much mold there is. So it is so important to get this tested because mold is also an endocrine disruptor. It throws off your hormones um, and it, things can really shift. I've seen it also appear in um, implants. So a lot of like, whether it's like, um, a lot of times like patients that struggle with breast implants, so certain mm -hmm. people tend to react to them. Mm -hmm. um, that has been, there's been some kind of correlation there. It's the reason I got into mold related illness to begin with was because I was seeing women who struggled with their breast implants, um, especially after explanting, they didn't feel good. Like they started getting better, but they didn't completely feel like 100% resolved. So um, I actually, a big part of my practice at one point and still um, is that I would work with these women who had been to many specialists out there. So they had been to rheumatologists, cardiologists, like any kind of GI, any kind of specialist, you name it, they've, they'd gone to. And they had done all these labs um, for not feeling well. Like a lot of them couldn't get out of bed or like they just had like puffiness, inflammation, joint pains, um, sensitivity to heat, heat rashes, things like that. Um, and they just didn't feel good. And they would go to all these specialists and they would oftentimes, unfortunately, they would be told that everything is in their head um, and there's nothing wrong with them and they should just take this anti-anxiety medication and that's it. Hmm. And they would come to me and they would, we would do these specialty labs where we would look at the metabolites of mold mycotoxins that your body actually is excreting. And in this patient population, I was finding very, very high levels of mold. Um, and because of these women, I actually got into mold related illness. I started taking extra courses in mold and got into like a whole rabbit hole of mold. And I realized how much, how many people struggle for mold. And I see a lot of autoimmune conditions in my practice too. So a lot of times when we do test on people that like, why do they have this autoimmune condition to begin with? Um, we try to find out like what's going on with them. We test for mold, like mold mycotoxins, and we see that there's very high levels of mycotoxins that they're excreting from their urine. So a big, big culprit, I would say, is mold. Check your home for mold. If you were like, if you had an old car and it had like um, an AC system that like leaked and mm -hmm. you've been in there, a lot of times that can be a cause for mold too. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of times, like even when people like move into a new home or an apartment, they're very oftentimes misled and the right people don't come to check the house and inspect the house. Um, and they oftentimes move into moldy homes and it is a big, big issue and it really throws off everything. And when it, it's like, I would say it is one of 
the biggest endocrine disruptors throwing off hormones. Wow. Wow. So what I hear a lot about um, detoxes and, and people trying to balance their hormones through detoxes or through changing their diet. Can you speak to whether or not that's useful? I think it's very useful, actually. So a lot of times what happens is um, these detoxes are specifically um, the specific purpose for these detoxes is to help with the metabolism of estrogen. Okay. So a lot of these issues, um, especially when it comes to like abnormal weight gain, I would say that's a big one, is because the estrogen's not able to metabolize well in your body. Estrogen is needed. I don't want to say it's not needed because there are so many trends out there trying to eliminate estrogen completely. And I always think, well, like you're going to just have like saggy skin, like wrinkles at a young age, um, vaginal dryness, like bone density issues and all of that. But estrogen is needed. But a lot of times what happens is people, we have different pathways of detoxification. One of them is referred to beta-glucuronidation, and it's led by the specific enzyme beta-glucuronidase. And when that one, oftentimes you could test for this, tends to be elevated, it indicates to us that there's some kind of issue going on with your body's ability, specific, specifically your liver's ability to detox estrogen. And we all know like liver is a main organ for detoxification. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of detoxes that help to support your liver health to naturally get rid of those estrogens so that you don't have that overproduction of estrogen mm -hmm. so that you can lose weight more easily you can create a balance between the estrogen and progesterone. You can also create a balance for men between the estrogen and testosterone so that you don't get those symptoms of high estrogen. Mm -hmm. And then there's also um, just, it also goes back to gut, gut health where you have to also make sure that you're eating foods that are um, high in fiber so that you can really help to bind these estrogens from your body and really help get them out of your body. Yeah. Um, because we do tend to have high estrogen levels in the society. And there's, which makes sense, because I always, I always joke around about this, like with friends and stuff. And I'm like, like, it's all plastic water bottles. Like we're all like, and all this plastic that we use. Yeah. Like, you know what, if you don't care about the environment, we know we know how bad plastic is for our environment. Mm -hmm. But if you don't care about the environment, maybe you care about your hormones. <laughs> and maybe because of that, you'll, you'll make a change. It's impossible to avoid plastic 100%. Oh, like it's just sure. not going to happen. Yeah. But I always ask about plastic water bottles because that's like something that you can change. You don't need to always drink out of plastic water bottles. There's so many people that all they drink at home is plastic water bottles. Like I get it. Like if you're going out and about, like sometimes you just, you're thirsty, you get a plastic water bottle. But the fact that if you're getting your water always from a plastic source, whether it's BPA or BPA free, which is the same, same thing, it binds estrogen. So it mimics estrogen and it throws off the receptor site. And these are also endocrine disruptors and they throw off your hormones. And it's a huge reason, in my opinion, why we have this kind of estrogen imbalance with our other hormones or perfume or um, or um, cosmetics or laundry detergent. All of these have these chemicals that mimic estrogen in our body and throw off that receptor site. Wow. So. I mean, what you're talking about is so important. And I imagine that people listening are taking notes and going, okay, I can check this, I can do that, I can change this. But for somebody who maybe doesn't have either the time resources or the financial resources to make huge lifestyle changes in all of these different areas of life, what's the thing that you would recommend they start with in terms of you know, getting labs done, of course, and figuring out what is actually the root cause of what they're feeling. But then what are some of the, the what is the number one lifestyle change you would recommend that people make to really support having balanced hormones? So this comes back to the foundations of health. And it might seem obvious, but really 
it comes down to a big one is water intake. I've Mm -hmm. had, and I don't know if like you've also had this with clients before where like, if you ever ask them about their water intake, it's shocking. I've, I'm not kidding. I've had patients who say they don't drink, they drink water every four days. And I'm like, you do not need me. You like, you do like, thank you for coming in, but you do not need me. Just please drink water. Like the general rule of thumb is half your body weight in ounces of water per day. Oh, wow. Interesting. That's a lot of water. It is. It's a good amount of water, but it's just shocking. Like a lot of times, like I'll get people that come in and they'll say like they have headaches and they're constipated and they have terrible, terrible PMS, like so, so bad. And they have menstrual pain and all of that. And all, and I'm like, I'm not giving you any supplements. I'm not doing anything. Just up your water intake. Because if you up your water intake, you will able to digest your food better and you will be able to get rid of toxins in your body Mm. by with bowel movements, urination and all of that. And if you get rid of those toxins, you are balancing your hormones. So I know it sounds kind of basic, but it is so like, it is something I see in practice so much. Yeah. And then then of course, and then of course, just supporting stress levels, getting good sleep, exercising, these are really, they're all really important. I'm hearing that. I'm hearing that. Thank you so much for this talk. This has been so insightful. Um, where can people reach you if they want to work with you? So um, my website, beverlyhillsnaturalmedicine.com. You can find out all the information there. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for listening, everyone. I will be right back next week with another episode of Get Naked with Dr. Kate. If you want to work with Dr. Jasmine, check out her website. We will have her information in the show notes as well. So if you want to refer back, they are there. And if you're looking on how to uh, looking for a way to balance the stress in your life, especially if it comes to inequities in domestic labor or emotional labor, you can always reach out to us at modernintimacy.com slash contact for a consultation. We'll see you next week. Thank you for listening to Get Naked with Dr. Kate. Stay connected with me on Instagram and TikTok at Dr. Kate Balistrary. Everyone has questions and I want to answer as many as I can. So feel free to email your questions to question at getnakedpodcast.com. If you're looking for a free 30-minute consultation with me or someone on my team, visit modernintimacy.com. And don't forget to join our newsletter, Modern Intimacy, on Substack. Let's meet back here next week. A new episode drops every Tuesday. Disclaimer, this podcast is not a substitute for therapy and does not constitute a professional relationship with Dr. Kate Balistrieri or Modern Intimacy. This podcast is strictly for education and entertainment purposes only.